Welcome to this presentation. The speaker that's going to be speaking is Trenton Schalk. Trenton is a natural resource specialist with the technical review and oversight team, TROT, in the planning technical review section. He has a BS in natural resources and environmental studies from Texas State University. Trenton has worked for TZ, TZEQ since 2020 as a natural resource specialist. His duties include reviewing exceptions and CT studies. Everyone, Trenton Schultz. Howdy, can you hear me? All right. Um, so welcome to the 2022 uh, TCQ uh, Public Drinking Water Conference. My name is Trent Chalk, and I'm, uh, I work for the Technical Review and Oversight Team. Uh, today, we're going to be going over some common exceptions and the uh, conditions uh, for approval. Um, all right, so a few housekeeping items before we start. If you have any questions, uh, you can send an email to this PTRS at tcq.texas.gov. Um, this will get uh, all your questions. It'll get sent to either I or one of my colleagues, and we can uh, answer any questions you may have or point you to the, um, to, towards someone that can effectively answer your question. Um, this contact info will also be shown at the end of this presentation. Um, so if you miss it now, you'll get it later. Um, also, I'll have the TCEQ uh, TROT checklist and guidance documents. Uh, that web page will be displayed at the end uh, of this presentation as well. Um, and those are checklists I'll be going over um, during this presentation. So a quick overview of the presentation. I'm going to be going over rules uh, for the exception requests, uh, process to obtain an approved exception, and common types of uh, exception requests that uh, we see. So if you, if you see here, um, this is the web page uh, for requesting an exception to the rules and regulations for the public water systems. It goes, every, uh, it goes over everything from what an exception is, how your exception will be reviewed. Um, it has that, if you look up in the top right, it has that PTRS email as well. So that way if you forget it, you guys can find it here. Um, it includes the email to uh, submit exception requests and it will answer 90% of the questions you may have on submitting an exception uh, so you guys don't have to deal with uh, talking to anybody if you don't want to. Uh, what is an exception? Uh, if a public water system in Texas is not unable to meet a requirement in 290 subchapter D, an alternative to meeting the rule can be requested through the exception process. Um, the request for an exception to a rule in subchapter D uh, must be substantiated by carefully documented data. A lot of that data you're going to find on the checklist. If you follow those checklists, you're gonna, you're, it's going uh, to lead you right. Um, and the alternative uh, being proposed must be equally as protective of public health as the regulation. Uh, public health is the name of the game, uh, so uh, that's always first and foremost. Um, all exceptions must, be, uh, must precede the submittal of plans and specifications. Uh, basically, you must get an exception first and then get plan review approval. Uh, if you go to plan review first, uh, you're not going to do much except really waste your time uh, because they're going to kick you back toward us. Uh, so come to us first. Uh, approved exceptions are granted to PWSs via site-specific review. Uh, we can't grant blanket exceptions. Uh, each well is, in, uh, is unique in its own way, and we grant uh, based on each individual well. All right, uh, 29039L here, the uh, exception rules. This kind of talks about how we deal with exceptions. Um, it, it states here that requests for exceptions to one or more of the requirements in this subchapter will be considered on an individual basis. Again, uh, no, no blanket exceptions or anything. Uh, any water system which requests an exception must demonstrate to the satisfaction of the executive director that the exception will not compromise the public, public health or result in a degradation of service or water quality. You need to protect the public health. Um, if you look here at um, L1, it must be requested in writing and substantiated by carefully documented data. Um, the request for the exception shall precede the submission of engineering plans and uh, specs for a proposed project for which an, uh, an exception is being requested. It also uh, goes on to state that any exception granted by the commission is subject to revocation and any uh, request for an exception which is not approved by the commission uh, in writing uh, will be considered denied. Um, the executive director may establish site-specific requirements for the systems that have been granted an exception. The requirements may include, but are not limited to, site-specific design, 
uh, operation maintenance and reporting requirements. Basically, this right here, this 39L, it's gonna go over um, everything that we look for um, with exceptions and kind of how we consider things. Um, and this gives you, the, uh, gives you a good outline um, of what to expect. Uh, basically, you're gonna wanna tell us why, you know, why can't you meet the rule? You're gonna tell us what, what you plan on doing instead of meeting the rule, and you're gonna tell us how or how your uh, proposal will continue to uh, protect the public health. Now, who can submit exceptions? Um, public water systems and their representatives for almost any rule between 290.41 through 0.46. Uh, and professional engineers licensed in Texas, uh, they can also uh, submit pilot study reports under 290.42 and um, alternative capacity requirements under 290.45. Now, uh, when are you gonna wanna uh, submit the exception requests? Before the PWS is locked into a course of action that will result in a deviation from the rules. Uh, you're gonna wanna submit that exception so you don't get yourself in trouble. Uh, now, to comply in response to an alleged violation noted during a comprehensive compliance inspection. If you have, uh, like, a, um, the regional inspectors go out and uh, they find something wrong, they might tell you that you need to uh, request uh, an exception uh, to some rule. And then before submitting engineering plans and specifications for review and approval, again, before you send for plan review, uh, come to us and uh, request any exceptions you may need. Um, what is required in an exception uh, submittal? Uh, you're gonna wanna include a TCEQ 2659 form here, and that's what is uh, up on the screen there so you have an idea. Um, it's gonna have the requester information, uh, which is one of you guys. Uh, it's gonna have the public water system information, and you're gonna, have, uh, you're gonna be able to put a summary of the exception request. Uh, I find this, when it's in the submittals, I find this extremely helpful because I can figure out who's requesting this and I can get with you if I have any questions or uh, concerns about the submittal. And I can see down here at the summary, I can uh, kind of get an idea of uh, why the exception is being requested. Uh, you're gonna want a signed cover letter as well, um, as well as a proposed alternative explanation and supporting documentation, which I'll, I'll explain um, later on in the slide with uh, the checklists. Now, where do you submit exceptions? You can submit these exceptions to us either through uh, USPS, the mail, or through email. Uh, generally, it seems like if you send it through email, you're gonna, we're gonna get it faster. We're gonna be able to um, uh, start reviewing it faster. So for some of y'all um, that are worried about getting it back quick, uh, I would probably say shoot it to us through email. And again, that email is down at the bottom, that PTRS at tcq.texas.gov. That's on that web page that I showed previously, um, and you can submit through there. Um, how long does it take TCQ to review the request? We get this question a lot, you know, where's my exception? Why haven't I seen it yet? Well, each exception request is reviewed to ensure that if granted, the PWS uh, will still deliver safe drinking water to its customers at adequate pressures. So with exceptions, your general exceptions, your sanitary control easements, your pressure, um, uh, pressure cementing and, and whatnot, it's gonna take 100 days. From the, from the time that we receive it, uh, that ticker starts going and we have 100 days. Uh, with ACRs, it's a little bit different and uh, we will get, uh, we get 90 days to get it back to you guys. How does the exception process work? So once the PWS submits an exception, request uh, the TCEQ, um, one of us, uh, my colleagues or I, are assigned the review. We're gonna go through there, we're gonna see it, make sure y'all um, submitted all the documents that we need. Uh, we're gonna go through, the, write the letter and, and make our determination. Um, and once we do that, a formal letter will be mailed with the exception determination, granted or denied. Um, now keep in mind that a TCQ uh, regional office, uh, whichever one is relevant to your PWS uh, based on your county, and uh, the PWS administrative contact, which you can, guys can find on Drinking Water Watch, um, will also receive a copy of this exception letter. So there's multiple going out. Um, the PWS must keep a copy of the granted exception letter and any relevant data required by the exception for as long as the, uh, the exception is valid. Um, it's because this letter and the documentation uh, must be made available to TCQ staff uh, when requested. Um, if you have like an, um, a regional investigator, investigator come out and he's uh, checking out the site, uh, he may wanna see that. Um, so it's, it's always important to have that on hand so you can say, hey, uh, don't get me. Uh, granted exceptions and conditions here. Um, 
Granted exceptions will list conditions that have to be met for the exception to remain valid. Um, for example, as part of a granted exception to a well setback exception, uh, the PWS must sample the subject well monthly uh, for bacteriological analysis. Uh, we want to see that the well is uh, not contaminated or anything like that. Uh, some exceptions may be granted for a period of time. A PWS uh, that was granted an exception to the elevated storage tank capacity uh, for two years while they decommission and construct a newly ele uh, new elevated tank. So sometimes there's kind of like a, a hard deadline for you to uh, get something done, like uh, a new storage tank. Also, uh, some exceptions may expire or state an expiration date and re will require data to be submitted for a non-expiry exception. Um, an exception for the use of an inline booster pump, uh, booster station was granted for one year, but the PWS must collect and submit distribution pressure data uh, for 30 days and submit for a review of the exception without an expiration date um, in order for that uh, condition to be uh, uh, fulfilled. And then a couple of last things again that I just want to kind of reiterate here is as a condition of granting the, uh, um, the exception, the TCQ may establish site-specific design, operation, maintenance, and reporting requirements for the system. Each well, again, it's unique, and uh, different wells will have different uh, conditions, and uh, they need to be followed. Um, any granted exception can be revised, and it can be revoked. So just because you guys receive a letter, uh, granted or denied, um, it doesn't, well, granted here, but it, it doesn't mean uh, that's the end of the story. It can be revised or revoked based on the, the condition of that well. All right, so I'm, uh, I'm about to uh, go over some, uh, some common exceptions here uh, that we commonly see here uh, at TROT. Uh, they're all under 290.41C. Uh, uh, These well related, uh, the exceptions that we generally see uh, and are some of the most common are the setback distance requirements, and they're under um, 290.41C1, uh, A3. Sanitary control easement requirements, they're under uh, 294.1C1F, and pressure cementing requirements, uh, 290.C3C. Uh, um, with the setback distance requirements, it, it, this includes the uh, setbacks of up to 50, 150, 300, 500, and up to a, um, a quarter of a mile away. Uh, common documentation that you're going to need uh, when you come um, to us to uh, request a, a well-related exception, it's going to include a well report uh, for the well, uh, maps, a general location or a detailed site map of the well site and the surrounding affected properties. Um, you're gonna, we're going to want to see, in most cases, a recorded deed of all the property owned by the PWS uh, within 150 feet of the well. And then a statement confirming the actual or suspected presence or absence of hazards up to a quarter mile from the well. Um, and these are some of the most common things um, that we'll, we'll, requ we'll uh, re request with uh, these uh, kind of common um, uh, well exceptions. So for example, here I have a, a well location map. Um, when I see this in a submittal, I, I, I kind of like it here. Um, if, you, if you look there, you can see the, uh, the kind of the, the well location. A lot of times that'll include the uh, coordinates, the Latin long coordinates. Uh, you can see a, um, a, a radius there. In this case, it's 50 and 100 feet, it looks like. And you can see, um, it's, a, it's a little bit unclear, but you can see there's a well setback, or a, um, oh, a detention pond, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, that's located on that, uh, what looks to be that property. You can also see the adjacent property owners, and it's, uh, their, their, um, their information is listed there as well. Uh, when, I see, when I see something like this, it's, this is a good detailed site map. It helps me immensely because I can take a look at this one map right here, and I can determine a lot of, a lot of information from it. Um, and it, it'll, help, uh, it'll help with my review, and it helps speed things up uh, as far as uh, from a review period. Head back to the, the well exception, uh, setback exception. Um, it states under um, this 294, uh, 41 uh, well setback rule that groundwater sources shall be located so that there will be no danger of pollution from flooding or sun unsanitary surroundings. And some of this can include things such as sewage, sewage treatment plants, uh, livestock, which is common around here, animal pens, and improperly sealed wells. Now to obtain an exception, you're going to want to submit some of this, uh, this common information here. Um, and it's a uh, clear, des uh, des uh, clear description of the existing conditions, a state of Texas well report, uh, again, the detailed site map, which you guys just saw, a statement describing any sanitary hazards, and a, uh, a copy of uh, the sanitary control easements, if applicable. Uh, you can also request the SCE at the same time as the well setback. 
uh, and a recorded deed for all the property owned by the PWS. Um, as you can see here, this is a, uh, an example of a well pollution hazard survey checklist, and it's kind of helpful. It, you know, it shows some of the well setback distances ranging from you know, 50, 150 feet, uh, et cetera. Um, and you, um, this is what we like to see a lot with these exceptions, and this is what I'll ask for uh, sometimes just to make sure that uh, you know, I have it in writing here that uh, there's no uh, potential um, hazards. Um, if any well is located with any of these uh, specified well setback distances, uh, an exception to the TCQ's well setback distance requirement uh, may be, uh, uh, need to be requested. Um, multiple well setback exceptions can also be requested at the same time. Uh, if you have one that falls under uh, 41C1A and one that falls under 41C1B, you may need to request a well setback for both. Um, and it's also helpful to include uh, a detailed map uh, showing a well pollution hazard um, in uh, relation to that uh, PWS well. All right, uh, the sanitary control easement rule here. Uh, it's uh, under 290.41C1F. Uh, um, it requires each public uh, water well to be protected by a 150-foot sanitary control easement to uh, protect it from pollution hazards. Uh, if a public water system doesn't own uh, all of the property with 150 feet uh, of the well, it must request the adjacent landowners to grant a sanitary control easement. So just keep that in mind. Again, as you can see here, it's very similar to the well setback uh, um, exceptions. You're going to want to um, uh, to obtain an exception. You're going to want to submit a state of Texas well report, a detailed site map. Uh, with the property boundaries and everything, which will be helpful. Um, the well setback uh, hazard survey there, describing any sanitary hazards. Uh, recorded deed, uh, copies of easements already obtained, and copies of letters uh, sent to the property owners. A lot of, a lot of times when I'm doing these uh, reviews, I see issues with the uh, solicitation uh, from the adjacent property owners. Um, they're either missing the certified mail receipts or they're missing the actual, you know, the solicitation or anything like that. Uh, just make sure that any of those properties that fall within 150 feet, make sure that uh, you guys are, are, are um, sending that to us each for each of those properties. Uh, we just want to be, uh, uh, it, it'll, um, it'll speed up the process because if, if they're not included, we're going to have to come back to you all and request them anyway. Um, in lieu of requesting an exception to the SC requirement, a public water system can also pass uh, an enforceable ordinance that is l at least as strict as an easement or obviously can own all the land within 150 foot uh, radius of the well. Uh, if you own all the land within 150 feet, you're golden. So, um, but obviously that's not uh, feasible in all uh, instances. Um, Correspondence with the landowner is also not required if the property is public land or a public road or railroad right away. So uh, this means if your well falls within 150 foot radius of a military base, I-35, um, or any road in general, um, and or a railroad, uh, you guys typically don't need to, uh, you guys don't, I'm not going to ask you to uh, solicit the U.S. government uh, um, or the railroad or anything like that, TxDOT. You guys will just come to us and solicit the um, or ask for a, an exception to the right of way uh, there. Um, and as you can see here, there's a sanitary control easement checklist. Um, and that's on that website that I had on that, on that first slide or two. Um, it's located there. You can find links on that web page to these checklists. And if you follow this checklist to a T here, we're not going to come back at you. We're not going to ask for any information. Uh, and you're not going to hear from us until you receive a letter you know, uh, from us. Uh, this, and just remember that that solicitation um, must include a copy of your correspondence with each of those adjacent landowners um, where you couldn't uh, obtain a sanitary control easement. And any property that falls within 150 foot radius must be solicited. If you look at that 150 foot radius and there is a property with just, the corner is just barely inside of there, and uh, I know it, it seems silly sometimes, but you need to request um, an SE for that property um, and, and just play it safe. Um, so just keep that in mind, because I've had that question a, a couple times, actually. Um, the certified mail receipts must also be provided as proof uh, that the PWS solicited an adjacent property owner. Uh, we just want to see that you guys have uh, made a good faith effort to um, contact those adjacent uh, uh, property owners um, for sanitary control. If you can see here, this is, uh, this is an example, I guess, of a, uh, 
um, a certified mail receipt. Uh, we'd like to see this. It can show us like when it was delivered or anything like that. If you look below that barcode there, you'll see that number start 9590. Um, we can also look that up. Um, if for some reason maybe you lose it, we can probably look it up. But if you have that number, we can probably look it up and see that you guys made a, um, a good attempt there. But from, from my experience, uh, in my short time here at TCEQ, uh, most of my issues with the sanitary control easements come from the solicitation was not all submitted or these uh, certified mail receipts weren't all submitted. Uh, pressure submitting, um, it falls under 290.41C3C. Um, it requires the space between the casing and the drill hole to be sealed uh, by a pressure submitting method using one of the methods in accordance with the AWWA standard for water wells, appendix C2, C3, C4, C5. Again, you can probably see that there's a uh, clear trend going here with what you guys need to submit. Um, it varies very little from the other two well setbacks or sanitary control easements. Uh, a clear description of the existing condition, proposed protective measures, State of Texas well report, a detailed site map uh, containing 150 foot radius and property boundaries, uh, a statement describing any sanitary hazards which you can, uh, will cover by that um, well hazard survey, and a copy of uh, sanitary control easement if applicable. Uh, most of this, um, these documents, that, they're all very similar to what you have to submit, so if you can get the process down, if you can watch those checklists, uh, you're gonna be, you're gonna have it made in the shade. Uh, as you can see here, there's also a pressure submitting method exception checklist. It's on that web page. There's a link there to it. If you submit everything here, or uh, you know, most of everything, uh, you should be good. I don't think that you'll run into any issues uh, if you follow this exception to a T. Um, so, it's your, it's going to be your friend here. Um, the pressure cementing, it's going to apply to existing and proposed wells, and includes the pressure cementation method. Um, any issues with annular space? Grouting requirements uh, for construction of the well. Um, this, uh, the pressure cementing uh, checklist contains um, uh, the pressure cementation methods that are in accordance with the uh, AWWA standard for water wells. If you look up at the top there, you can kind of see them listed in order um, just below that first paragraph. Um, it shows um, kind of the approved pressure cementation methods there uh, from section C2 uh, through five, such as you know your positive displacement or anything like that. Um, so if you're curious and you want just a quick look to see you know anything, you can look there. Um, and that's what I'll do sometimes, just for a quick look. Um, here's an example of a cementing certificate, which is also very helpful. If you have this or you, man you happen to have it, um, it it's very helpful because um, the a cementing certificate, uh, it may be required to ensure complete sealing of the annular space. Um, it also has additional information detailing uh, the cement specifications, including the type of cement and the percentage of bentonite. Uh, I can go on here and I can say, oh look, they, they used um, an abnormally large amount of cement. Maybe there's an issue there. Maybe they're trying to fill up a cave or you know, they're using the wrong percentage of bentonite in their uh, cement. Um, so it's just a, um, a good thing to have and uh, to submit uh, with some of these exceptions. All right, uh, the typical approval uh, process uh, for conditions, once you guys get them submitted, you get all the documentation ready to go and stuff. Um, the exception will be first granted and it's generally valid for three years. Uh, during this three year period, uh, the PWS must generally sample the well, uh, typically on a monthly frequency for 12 consecutive months and submit those samples for bacteriological analysis. Uh, sometimes, depending on the well and how many hazards there may be around it, um, we'll bump that up to twice monthly sampling um, or even to, to four lugs sometimes in uh, extreme cases. Um, so it, it does vary, but generally uh, with uh, kind of your run-of-the-mill well, it, it'll be uh, a monthly uh, you know, uh, frequency, once a month. Um, you're going to submit those samples to a TCEQ accredited laboratory. Uh, with a current National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation uh, Certification. I believe your condition or your exception letter will have a link that will uh, lead you to a, a list of those, and I believe there was some, uh, some of those uh, labs that were here as well that y'all might run, have run into. Um, and then 12 months will, of results uh, will be reviewed by, the, by TROT, by the Technical Review and Oversight Team. Um, once 12 months of data is available for review, uh, the technical review and oversight team 
We'll review uh, for an exception uh, with the aim to have no expiration date on that. Uh, if the results show that there were no positive bacteriological samples and there were no positive E. coli samples, um, the exception can be approved with no expiration date. Um, but be, be aware that um, the PWS will need to continue to require a monthly raw water sampling uh, for uh, bacteriological analysis of the PWS well for as long as it's used as a PWS source. I know this has kind of caused some heartache uh, in, uh, previously, uh, but um, there, there will be no deadline, but you still got to test monthly. Um, if results indicate treatment may be required, um, the expiration date, uh, it can be requested, or ex I mean, uh, requested. It, should, it could be uh, extended, I'm sorry, um, and additional bacteriological uh, monitoring or four log treatment of the groundwater source uh, could be required. Um, so if we, if we start to uh, review your samples uh, for that 12 months or however long, and we say, hey, look, there's, uh, there's a couple of E. coli hits here or an excessive amount of bacteriological um, hits, we're like, all right, well, let's move this up to twice monthly or um, for a little bit longer to get more data, or we'll say, uh, let's move it up to, to four log treatment. All right, so um, a basic summary of the exception process here. Um, exceptions are available to the rules in um, the 290 subchapter D. Uh, the request must be submitted in writing, and you can submit those either through the mail or uh, through that PTRS uh, email that I've uh, been on about. Remember, it must not compromise public health. That's, that's uh, first and foremost. And those conditions that we'll put in the letter will reflect that and uh, will be aimed to um, put uh, public health first and foremost. Uh, they're site specific. Uh, there's no blanket exceptions. Um, all of the uh, exceptions, they must be supported by carefully documented data. If you guys go, and uh, I'm gonna repeat myself here and beat a dead horse, but you get those checklists, uh, for those exceptions that I've explained, you're not going to go wrong. Make sure everything that's in those exceptions you, you send in and you guys are good to go. Um, they are going to be subject to periodic review and or revocation, um, and the exceptions may establish uh, site-specific conditions uh, that must be met. All right, so on here, uh, just to wrap up, I guess, um, I have included the, uh, the link here to the exception website. That's that, that, um, that web page that I showed in the, uh, the beginning. That's going to have everything you need. Um, that it's going to answer 90% of your questions. It's going to tell you how to submit, what to submit. It's going to give you the links to all those checklists. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead you right. If you still got questions, you can email that PTRS email. And that will get you um, to, uh, in contact with someone that will answer your question. Uh, and uh, give you a satisfactory answer. I've also included the plan review website as well, just for your convenience. Um, and we do have a, a TA room out here um, with uh, a bunch of trot folks that are eager to answer your questions. Um, but uh, 